back and bigger than ever. It's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Soonerscoop crew, Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. All right, we are back. That's right, uh, back in studio. Bob Prisbillo uh, is working. We just finished a Zoom call with defensive coach uh, Alex Grinch. And John Michael Terry and Nick Benito. So uh, Bob is off working. He'll be joining us shortly as he's taking care of those writing duties. It's like you run a sweatshop around here. Uh, we do what we got to do. It's because of Josh's kids. It, I'm blaming Josh's kids. It's fair. He's in the back. Appointments. I blame my children, so it's fine. We actually had a Sooner Scoop fight last night. About the pod today because I had to grovel. The fans grovel, want it out grovel. on Wednesdays. I'm dedicated <laughs> to bringing it out on Wednesdays. Uh, our Zoom calls were moved up to 11:30, so Eddie gets off the air at 10, which made it almost impossible to do. So we're doing it right after the Zoom calls. Uh, here we are, folks. Texas is over with. It's a bye week for the Sooners, and uh, Josh has not had a chance to weigh in yet on Texas. Bob is not either. We Eddie and I did the. Moving uh, Eskridge Lexus post game podcast after the show. I think it turned out okay. Um, and uh, here we are. Sooners uh, into their bye week. It uh, looks like they're heading towards TCU. I think there's a lot of games across the country right now that are being postponed. And Baylor's part of the problem. Uh, Florida's part of the problem. Uh, Ole Miss now is a part of the problem, Eddie. Is that right? Supposedly. I don't know. I don't know if this was COVID or if this was STDs running around the Oxford campus. I mean, we are talking about Joey Freshwater. <laughs> uh, so Our uh, leader, my hero. Here we are. Sooners win it 53-45, uh, to 45, I believe, the final score. It seems like it was a year ago. I have actually watched the replay of the game twice. Uh, but, Josh, I'll just start with you. You come out of this thing, defense looked good for about 55 minutes. Then they sucked as bad as you could suck for about five minutes. They never Texas never should have been able to tie up the game, as we find find out, because the Big 12 officials, uh, Greg, uh, what's his name? Oh, oh, Burks, Burks, Greg yeah. Burks. I was trying to think of the, uh, the the like the actual referee because that guy's usually pretty good. Yeah, and those guys are active referees, so I mean they're out there, you know, sweating with the rest of them. So. You know, they don't ever want to admit embarrassment, but they admit that they screwed it up and they added 39 seconds extra to the clock, which we all kind of knew after we saw the replays. Uh, so Texas technically should have run out of time before they could have scored their final touchdown. And Lincoln Riley probably would have run it on third and nine instead of trying to throw it over the middle to Austin Stogner uh, because that would have taken even more time off the clock. And uh, here we are. Um Josh, how do you feel about Oklahoma football as, as we stand today? Well, you know, I agree with you, Kerry. You look at it. I mean, guys, they gave up, what, one real drive that entire 56 minutes we're talking about? I mean, Oklahoma's po or Texas's points came off of turnovers. I mean, it was yeah. just a – so little you could and, – and one of them, they, they held to a field goal when, they, when you thought – when that play happened, you thought, okay, here, you know, this is going to happen. This is going to be seven. You know, Ellinger is going to walk right in. And Oklahoma stiffened. They played well down there and, you know, made it, came up with a nice stop. So I, I still, I, you know, and I know I, I, Lincoln Riley said it. I feel like this defense is close to not being an elite unit or anything, but being a very functional group. Like I, I'm seeing fewer and fewer busts from week to week. I mean, you think about that Kansas State game. It, you know, just the catastrophic mistakes that they made. Yeah. Iowa State was a lot of little mistakes, and I feel like Texas was a lot, uh, I guess, fewer little mistakes. Like they keep minimizing the error just a little bit. And guess and, what? The mistakes know, that the defense did have, I don't know if they were all their fault. I don't know that Trey Brown really interfered on the interception, uh -huh. although I did see the tug on that people are talking about, and I've, I saw the broadcast, and they pointed that out on the broadcast. But the throw to the end zone where pass interference was called, and then there was another pass interference that was called, looked like two clearly uncatchable footballs, which Lincoln Riley was asked, does that rule still apply? And he's like, it still does, but they never seem to call it. it I mean, <laughs> like, it just seems like, you know, all the things that went against the OU defense were definitely very uh, judgment oriented by the referees. 
Yeah. You know, and, and I, you, you let in with something and I, and I have been very firm on this. I love Lincoln Riley going for it on the third down, throwing the ball. I, I know everybody hates it and is killing him for it. But the game's over it if happen. you get that first but down. Yes, you can't on one hand talk about Lincoln Riley not being aggressive, not trying to win the game, and then be pissed off that he didn't run the ball when he knew he wasn't going to get nine yards and immediately have to give Texas the ball back. I, guys, do you really feel like in that scenario, 120 or 202 makes that big of a difference? I don't. I, I think Texas was going to go score anyway. OU's defense was gassed. How, I guess, I'll start with this and then I'll go back to something else. How surprised were you that Texas didn't go for two in the end of regulation and or overtime? I was shocked. I, th- I, I think as much as any, I mean, and it's not like I watch Texas every week like I watch Oklahoma, but if you wanted to say there was a fireable offense, that might be the most Tom Herman fireable offense I've seen. They had all the momentum. They were running right down Oklahoma's throat. That defensive line was dog tired. And Ellinger was just finding ways. I mean, he's, whatever you want to say about him as a passer, as a runner, that dude's lethal. And it's like, um, I don't know, it's like Jason in the movies. Like he's never running fast. You're never like, Oh God, look at him go. It's not like Kyler Murray out in open space. You're just like five, 10, 12. Like he just keeps picking up yardage and you don't know how he's doing it. And uh, like I said, I, I don't know how they didn't go for it. I, I, I'm stunned they didn't. You know, it's, it's been really interesting watching the reaction. I, I, I I'm not one of these guys. Like I'm not drinking anymore. So I don't have a reason to go to Orange Bloods and just laugh, uh, at, at fan reaction, uh, which I sometimes would do in the past. But, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty friendly with everybody on the Texas beat. I mean, I've walked to the stadium with Chip Brown, and we just you know talked and you guys held hands. What'd no, you do? we didn't hold split hands. A, split a spliff or something. What'd you guys do? No, um, none of that. I know you're trying to get me to say something bad. I'm not going to. <laughs> Carries kicked the booze and moved to weed. Wait, just waiting. I get along just with all around of our, the weeds. You know, I mean, Ketchum and I have had our issues at one time or another, but we seem to get along now. He says nice things to me. I thought you said something lovely at his funeral a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I respect the dead. So, love you, but, Ketch. But in like, you know, I think uh, uh, Brian Davis. He was on the OU beat for a long time. Really great guy. And I, you know, I follow most of those guys like Danny Davis. I'm telling you, I have never seen a media collective just run down a coach like they're running down Tom Herman this well, week. Well, he didn't necessarily give any reason. Like usually, there's a buffer zone. If if people don't, if people like you, they're not gonna be as uh, critical as they've been. And mm-hmm. he's a dickhead. So people, he should be treated like one. Is he a dickhead to them though? I mean, remember like remember the first thing that he did pretty was decent media access there. I I think that they do, but remember the one of the first things that he did didn't he call him in and like this is how it's gonna be. You're not oh, gonna yeah. contact parents, and that didn't go well. It I, did not. Go I mean, well. it just kind of set the table for the meltdown that currently is the University of Texas, and just reading kind of between the lines of you know people that cover the, I, I think it was uh, I listened to a little bit of uh, catching Amwar's uh, take on. Because I do like licking the tears, and I <laughs> listened a little bit of it, and like the way that the eyes of Texas sound thing very horns down, horns up for peace to me. Yeah, we might be rethinking that policy. Uh, <laughs> just the way though that he's handled the eyes of Texas stuff has not been too endearing of the Texas fan base. Yeah, it sounds like I could see that. And I, I mean, I remember talking to McComas a couple weeks ago, or it was last week before the game when we did that podcast. Is like he had basically lost half of the fan base before the game and for that way that it went down i mean my gosh yeah i mean what i find kind of funny that's used against him so much is that he's one and four against oklahoma he's only been there for four this is fourth year at texas sure so he lost in the big 12 championship so that's where the five games come from but i mean you can't deny i mean everyone when i was talking to chip brown walking to the stadium it was basically like, there's no way Texas doesn't win this game, right? And I was like, I really can't argue with you. I mean, I've seen OU. And you the look last up and they're two up weeks, by, like, OU's up by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. Their fan base and their media so strongly believe that Texas was the better team going into that game. 
it's hard for anyone to believe that they could lose it, and then that they could lose it when all this other stuff comes out, like they added 39 seconds to the clock and it went to overtime after they tied it and there was no momentum towards Oklahoma and Spencer Rattler became a completely different player when overtime hit and you know they didn't go for two and all this stuff. But it's like, I'm also of the mind like, you guys, Texas isn't that good. Like, they're just not a well, really also, good football team. I think that's the other reality is that nothing's changed. Texas is the same program they've been for the last decade. I'm not sure they're as good as they were two years ago. Texas? I, yeah. Oh, I agree completely. I, this I, is crazy because their <laughs> offensive line was terrible at that point. I just don't get it. I don't I don't know and, how you I mean, can be so bad. It's kind of like OU defensively. I don't know how you can be so bad. Josh, you talked about this like... Here's one thing I don't understand. How is B. John Robinson not your number one running back? Yep. Like, I, that to me is uh, uh, evidence number one of your mismanaging your personnel. Keontae Ingram is a nice player. He's a nice player. B. John Robinson, when he gets the ball, you're like, I mean, guys. He, he left Deshaun White's jock in the dirt yes. on one play. Well, on that deep ball, and and – I never understood it during the broadcast uh, th- t- on this third and third down. I think in the third quarter, Texas has B. John Robinson deep, and Ellinger misses him. And they're like, "That's not what you want to be doing if you're Texas throwing to the freshman running back down the field." I'm like, "Why are we bagging on the running back? He was wide the hell open. Like Ellinger missed him. Like I, I don't know why this is the play call is bad. You've got a really good player that you're trying to get the damn ball to, and he beat Oklahoma's defense, and you're." Ellinger, who they just slobbered all over for four quarters, is is at no way at fault for his errant throw. Like I, but but I, I will I say this: Ellinger it. had a really poor day throwing downfield. Oh, Ellinger, Absolutely. he had the game really that poor. he had the game that Josh, you've been basically saying is Sam Ellinger for the last four years. He was really bad at points. He was okay at points. And then in the last, you know, when two possessions, time came, he, he took was, it all on his shoulders. He and basically said, "Come follow me." Wheeled the team. Yeah. Yes, basically. I mean, that's that's literally what you've said. He is for the last he, three or four. But years. nobody else was involved. It was just Sam Ellinger. Yep. I mean, he was oh, he the was only no one help. involved. I, it you doesn't know, make any sense, guys. You know, as, as Oklahoma fans, I wonder how many Oklahoma fans are like, and, and I think it's possible to not hate him because they're four and one against him, but like. I don't know how as an Oklahoma fan you don't kind of respect Sam Ellinger. Like, I agree. The kid's tough. He plays hard. He does, he's nothing nothing nasty about him. He's not a big trash talker. I mean, there's the horns up whining, you know, that kind of there stuff. There was the but, Kyler Murray incident that was ugly. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But, I mean, by Called and large, pussy, didn't he? he's a totally Take respectable your L, kid. pussy or something like that. I'm sure Kyler thinks about that every night. Being he sarcastic. He don't worry, Kyler won. <laughs> Kyler ain't going anywhere in the NFL, and Sam Ellinger will never get to his level. Kyler's going somewhere in the NFL, you mean? He, well, I mean, he's... No, yeah. I mean, he's one of the best young quarterbacks sure. in the NFL. That's not going to change. That's sure. what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he, I mean, he won that. I mean, he can... Oh, yeah. He can say whatever he wants about Sam Ellinger yeah. telling him to take the L, bitch. I think it was... He should. Bitch. He should. Every time Texas loses, he just, just tweet him. Take the well, L, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> in in four games this season, Kyler Murray has more NFL wins than Sam Ellinger had wins over Oklahoma in his career. Oh, so Kyler Murray, I mean, you know, is what it is. How many touchdown passes does Ellinger have against OU? I mean, a, honestly, probably not that many. They've all been four yards and out for you know, like first and goal from the three, yeah. and he just plows his body right. in there. Yeah, but not a lot of big plays against Oklahoma. Uh, you know that brings up the other side of the conversation, and you know I, I listen to post game and everything. I that that has become my Sunday morning ritual is I'm out at, basically at the park with the girls. That's and awesome. I I'm basically you your church. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, I'm gonna start giving going out to communion. Church. Exactly. I'm definitely not letting the girls listen to their particular uh, preacher. But um, I believe my f bomb this this yeah. week. Yeah, you did. You did. I was a little surprised being a road trip. I thought it kind of thought you just let it fly. Um, but uh. What did you guys think of Spencer Rattler? Like, what did you? I, I, That's the other I thing I wanted to get rating into. That convert, like that performance. I don't know how to put that. I mean, he got benched in the second quarter. You can yeah. call it whatever you want to call it. But Lincoln will never call it that. Just like he'll never call suspension suspensions, <laughs> right? I mean, I think it was uh, Joel Klatt that referred to it on a serious show this week as he got put in the corner. 
He got put in timeout. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whatever you want to call it, he got You bitched. had to, though. I mean, he was costing them the game himself. Like, yeah. you're a quarterback. You're The ball is in your hand every play. And there came a point in that game where Lincoln Riley literally had to say, we cannot trust you to be our quarterback any longer. He, as bad as he was, he made up for it in the fourth quarter he in did. overtime. I he mean, absolutely did. That was, uh, I, I guess it was mainly just overtime, but it felt like a full quarter. That was... And I compared this yesterday to, uh, you know, Baker Mayfield at Tennessee. Like, and I did that to Lincoln Riley because I feel like outside... Remember, guys, I, you were watching it on television probably, Josh. I mean, I don't know if you went back and watched it, Eddie, after the game was over. But the camera crews were literally showing Trevor Knight on the sideline early on in that Tennessee game. Like... Like, is yeah. the Baker Mayfield really doesn't look like the answer? Will they go to Trevor Knight? Like, well, this guy's a walk-on from Tech. What do you expect? Well, yeah, I mean, and and so things were not going well, and I could have seen Baylor, I mean, uh, Baker getting benched at some point. So, I, you know, in that game, he did bench. Uh, he, he finally did bench his quarterback, and then he comes back, and just like Baker late in the game, he starts to rally. He starts to figure it out. And in overtime, they go and win it in a game that is one of the most deathly loud games I've ever experienced down on the field. So, I mean, that was a much, much more difficult environment. But to me, the, there's a lot of parallels there. Take some, take some brass balls to do that to uh, a guy of, you know, I, I don't want to say stature of Rattler because he really hasn't accomplished a whole lot. But, I mean, he's a five-star kid yeah it, it could go the other way i guess it, it takes some balls to take that opportunity or take that when, chance when all the criticism out there is that lincoln won't ever you know talk back to his players or, sure. or coach them hard he, he them. benched his five-star quarterback in the biggest game of the year yeah i mean if the, if things go south and all of a sudden tanner mordecai josh turns the ball over two times and you know say that you're now down 24 to 10 at halftime or whatever i mean that thing could go very very far south Oh, absolutely. That that whole, I mean, you know, and that's something, and you guys touched on it in the post game, but, and I'm working on the hot 11. I'm about to finish it, actually. But, you know, that was Theo Weiss's moment, was right when all that was going on. Like, sure. I, I feel like when that offense needed a steadying force, someone to make some plays for him, kind of break things up a little bit, I felt like it was Theo Weiss that came up with some really tough catches. And obviously, TJ Pledger had some great runs in there as well. So it was. I thought as much as anything within the game, you saw all the flaws. I mean, Oklahoma's got plenty of problems. I said it multiple times during the game. This is not great football we're watching. But you saw the the young players that we've been talking about for weeks that need to emerge, playmakers, guys who can do things to help Oklahoma win games, both on offense and defense. I thought you started to see those guys emerging, the Woody Washingtons, the Theo Weeses, the Austin Stogners, um, you know, go down the list. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about all of these guys, but it was the first time where you thought, okay, here's some young guys starting to take some some charge of this team, you know, not just waiting for these upperclassmen that are that are solid players but are not clearly not going to be those guys. So you saw these young guys starting to step into the roles they need to take. Uh, big announcement. Uh, he has left the sweatshop. We've got him out of, the, out of Asia. And Bob Persbillo now joins us on, on the pod. Whoa, I'm offended by that. Uh, that was too far. <laughs> but Prince Billow does up, sound man? Japanese. There's no question. I don't know what dictionary you're using, but it doesn't <laughs> sound Japanese at all to me. By the way, it's Chinese, not Japanese. There's no sweatshops in Japan, are there? Eh, that we don't know Ooh. about yet. I mean, I'm sure that you know, are. at the risk of just starting a cultural war. like war. Malaysia, maybe. Thailand? Sure. Philippines, have to ask China else might be too big that. for. It's yeah. been a while since we had it. Is this racist segment? Yeah, hey, I know because Welcome everybody's going to get canceled. What's up, Bob? <laughs> Back from Malaysia. So he confirms Malaysia sweatshops. Okay, Bob. Bob's verdict. Talk to Bob. It's all on him, people. Asians. Yep. Email Twitter. B Chris Billow. Chris Billow. Yeah. There you go, Bob. We were talking uh, about just the kind of catch you up here really we're talking about spencer rattler but josh was kind of pointing out all the guys around spencer rattler theo wees tj pledger that that really started to emerge in this game uh and 
I mean, it's 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 the beginning of something, I think. Right, and that's why you're so confident about the second half of the season is when you get Ramondre Stevenson back and Seth McGowan and Hazelwood and Trajan Bridges. And cause you've already had the growing pains moments for some of these guys. You know, Theo Weiss sort of, you know, was missing in action during the first couple games. And that goes noticeable now when you start looking back as to why couldn't they figure out fourth quarter against Kansas State, second half against Iowa State. You know, they had to go through those moments and you hope that now that they've done it and then you start getting those other pieces back, then you start seeing what this offense should really look like rest of the way. And, and Bob, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the defense, uh, but I don't think we've – we haven't jumped into the defensive line and how well they played Isaiah Thomas, even LaRon Stokes, but Perry on Winfrey – God, I wish he would just wear a regular number. I mean, it's like that's I can't the, take him serious that, with that eight. What? And it does, the jersey doesn't that's, fit. That's, that's, that, that, there's that's nothing, old stuff. There that's, is no. That's the that oldest of olds. That I mean, there's nothing <laughs> sexier than a big been, guy in a single have jersey. People been wearing single digit jerseys at Florida State forever. <laughs> it's not new and because they and they've been badass. Now that they don't have any badasses down there outside of. Marvin Wilson, who we still love, who's twenty one. Yeah, who's twenty one? Yeah, by the way. exactly. Like it, it, it just comes I just with feel the territory. Like he's losing out on credit that he deserves. Well, I'm giving him plenty of credit. <laughs> he keeps making plays like he has been, and he gets even more credit. He's really good at stripping then, the football too, which we're, yes. we're coming to learn. But no, I mean, uh, even put Nick Benito in there. Uh, we talked to John Michael Terry, who uh, you've been working on some stuff with uh, with him that we talked with the defense today. Uh, but again, guys, I guess we should just open it up. Defensive line, the anchor of really of this team so far this but year. But real quick, by the way, Sam Ellinger, nineteen touchdowns versus Oklahoma. That may, uh, no, in through the air passes, passing touchdowns seven. Okay, twelve rush, Oof. seven passing. That, if that doesn't say it perfectly, that that is you you Should've kind of backed two. into that, Eddie. But that was perfect. Should have went for two. Yeah. Yeah, we, we literally were the about only that. way we he scores about, is when they go for two. I mean, <laughs> they're doing it from that distance, and I mean, they score all the time with Ellinger. Even as good as Oklahoma was playing on their defensive line, they weren't going to stop him on a two point. By the way, do you think that Lincoln Riley is trolling Ellinger because he's not using the hard G? He's using Ellinger. I don't know. He might be. I bet. Well, we talked about that at the last Horns Up for Peace meeting. Maybe he's taking it to heart. He doesn't think he's a hard G. I got it. And by and soft G, yeah, I bet it. So basically, he thinks he's a pussy. That's that's, that's what I'm getting at. Did I yeah. did I confuse this, or was there a point in the game where the refs tried to call OU for horns down, but then pulled the flag? Uh, you're talking about the time that they. Uh, it was after the Woody Washington interception, right? Maybe. Say what now, Bob? Well, they flag. They flag three, three players. Well, that was on, that was the Igwebu, uh punt block. That's when they said what? 14 What did something. they flag them for? Yeah. It was what unsportsmanlike. And I think it was for coming onto the field. Because okay. that's been right. a bad habit of this team. Like, they did that back at the Missouri State game. Because remember, I'm sure you guys were getting questions about it. Like, why didn't yep. the, the bench get flagged? Because, like, half the bench ran out into the end zone. Like, they've just gotten into a bad habit of running out onto the field. God forbid you show emotion in this conference. They should just go rules with the Mark rules, Ritt Eddie. school. They, yeah, you know what rules else is a rule? Are rules. Not adding fucking time to a clock that shouldn't be. That's a rule. Oh, wow. War is declared. Smoking dope. That's a rule. Can't do it. Yeah. Apparently. I don't, don't want to go there. I think we have to. <laughs> At some point, we can go. We can come back. Yeah, we haven't even mentioned that, have we? Lincoln Riley's comments on Ronnie Perkins this week. Well, he's going to write a book. He's professional well, teasing an autobiography. Probably pissed that somebody went out there and wrote a book without his permission. Can I make a request that he doesn't read his own book? Doesn't do the the voice for it. <laughs> if I, it's anything like his organ donor transplant uh, commercials, yeah, think, that's a, be a good I idea. I think Bob's just full time uh, narrator. He's going to read it at his own. <laughs> just let Stoops I mean, do yeah, it. Yeah, just let Bob do it. Like I I tried to listen to Bob's and it's I feel like I'm listening to a press conference like I can't do it like I you know I'm keep waiting for one of you guys to bump in with a question at some point like it, it was I it's just my brain couldn't handle him as the narrator of the story. I have the little red heart. Do you? <laughs> oh, God. 
<laughs> it would not be good. No. All right. Anyway, it's my organs when I die. No, but I mean that was kind of the the most interesting comment of the week, which just unprovoked. I mean, he was asked about Ronnie Perkins. I think Keegan uh, Renault asked him. It was a good question to ask, and he said, "One day, if I ever write a book, I'm going to include an entire chapter about the Ronnie Perkins saga." It is a saga. It has been for us, without a doubt. It's a. It's for a, me personally. What's the uh, it's been horrible? What's the what's the thing past a saga? An epic. Yeah, it's an, an epic. epic. Ooh, it's yeah. an epic, is what it is. Oh, nice. It right. might be an epic. Terry, I think if if Lincoln's going to write this story and Ronnie gets a chapter, you should write the forward. Oh my god, <laughs> to that chapter. <laughs> to the Holy chapter. shit! <laughs> we'll just call it Ronnie on the sideline. Oh man. Because, I mean, when oh, he GBs didn't... and Jihad. When he didn't show up in Dallas, I mean, like, Lincoln painted himself into a corner there. Yep. Didn't need yeah. that leadership anymore, I guess. <laughs> well, it didn't help the first time around. They lost. <laughs> fair, fair. But, I mean, who knew that Ronnie Perkins couldn't follow through and be reinstated? Uh, Why nobody. are you being so cryptic, Murdoch? Just say what you want to say. By the way, can I just say one note on that? If you people want to bitch at me all the time for not having great sources, it's not fair to say you suck and give us the information when I might burn sources. That's kind of counterproductive to what I do. I'm sure that's not enough for people to read between the lines nope. either. You don't want to burn a source. I'll just leave it at that, which I'm sure is not good enough. Unless they're covered in gasoline. Mm-hmm. So I mean no, but it 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 makes it it opens it all back up to like what the hell happened that we don't know about, or maybe we do know about it, and Lincoln just doesn't know that we've kind of put most of it out there. I mean, I think he does though, and I think he's okay with that. To be honest and then, with you, and then you see, um, the tweet this morning that got deleted quickly from Justin yes. Harrington. Four minutes, <laughs> literally four. Three or four minutes. And in the tweet, Justin Harrington says that Ramondre, Ronnie, and Trajan will be back for TCU. And Along with McGowan. Seth McGowan, yeah. And McGowan. Which, I don't think that should be that much of a surprise, right? Justin Harrington was on the sideline Saturday, and he looks good. Like, he looks like a football player. Like... You see him in person next to everybody else, even just in sweats, and you're like, damn, that kid looks good. I think there's a reason why he was expected to win a starting job yes. when he hit campus. He's massive for a corner. Safety. Or safety. I think so. I bet. I, I, there, to be fair, Kerry, there was a bunch of stuff out there that he was going to play corner. I know he was he was pushing that agenda, but I, I'd be shocked if he wasn't safety. I mean, right now, Woody Washington pushed out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot. Jaden Davis, I thought, had a good game. I mean, I think yep. the number was out Trey there. Trey Brown that, obviously yep. had two picks. Toby threw it only out. Got credited with Toby, one. Toby threw it out there on Saturday or in the broadcast. Ten guys played in the secondary on Saturday for OU. Ten. Trey Trey Norwood was replacing Delarian Turner Yell, which a lot of people didn't like, but it didn't seem to hurt him. Slowly but surely, is this the... I think they didn't like it because he wasn't replacing Pat Fields, though. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that the only answer that Oklahoma fans want are not seeing 10 and 44 out on the football field anymore. Uh, And they're out there more than anybody. (laughs) I think so. It's just a weird message to send, like, because I thought Turner Yale played... I mean, like, he wasn't flashy, but he had a solid game. He was okay. Uh, Had the big tackle, uh, I think, was that on Ellinger or Ingram out in space on that third down? Uh, Ellinger, because that was when yeah. free stripped them, but they didn't that's say what, it was a strip. They said that's progress was. was stopped. Yep, yep. So I mean, he he had some nice moments, and then you're. I mean, I didn't think Buki was that bad on Saturday. I thought he was okay. Um, I he didn't stand he out was, in a negative way. Yeah. No, the, but I mean, I, I don't know how long Oklahoma can do this. Like people are clearly making Pat Fields a target. I mean, they are just going at him. That was the the pass interference near the goal line there yeah. uh, in overtime. That's a walk on receiver. Well, you don't have to do it like that. 
Uh, come on, on dog. come on, guys! You, you don't have to do it like that. <laughs> Are you Dean Blevins shitting on Drake Stoops all of a sudden? Which will start a fucking war if you do it again, Dean. <laughs> what the? It's a fuck warning was shot. That? It's a warning Damn, shot. Damn, Dean! It's a warning shot. What? I, I guess I missed fucking this. dinosaur. Stop it was it. yesterday. Josh. Oh no, he was just he was. I think he was using Drake as an example of you. You know, you sort of season and you have all these five stars on campus. And then you look up, and he basically said, and, and you and look you up, and Drake, on. Drake has to play the entire game. He scored the game-winning touchdown. Show some respect around here. I got, I got you, Carol. I got you. You don't have to fight. We don't have to fight him. <laughs> we will, though. <laughs> God. It was funny. But, yeah, I mean, they, they are targeting Patrick Fields, and it's a problem. But I guess, in, in a way, it's not going to happen overnight, right? They're not going to just start throwing these. I, I, it's almost like a slow trickle down of all of a sudden you're going to look up and those maybe those numbers from Power Football Pro Football Focus will be reversed and you'll be seeing Woody Washington taking a bunch of more snaps. You'll be seeing Joshua Eaton take a bunch more snaps. I don't know. I I just thought like it wasn't going to happen overnight. I guess at the Cotton Bowl. Yeah, sure. not, oh, not with the freshmen for sure. They were more aggressive with it than I thought they would be. Honestly, I did. I, I mean, me too. I, I mean, but when when was the last time you saw a guy like a Woody Washington make a play like he did in the end zone on a ball? Well, he made another pass breakup that was sure outstanding. I, as well. And yep. Josh, you, I think you tweeted it during the game, or maybe even on Sunday. The fact that we haven't had to say Jane Davis's name. Tells me everything I need to know about Jaden Davis's year. He's been pretty solid. I, I, you could make a case he's been Oklahoma's most consistent defender. I mean, like just not a lot of highs, not a lot of lows, just good solid play down the middle. Now he he had the bad miss against Iowa State. I mean, he you know he, he's had ups and downs, but he had a great pass breakup on the deep ball against Texas where he looks back at the last second and breaks the ball up on what probably would have been a touchdown otherwise. I mean, he's. He's had some good moments as well, but he's been very, very steady. And, I mean, you look at it when, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the snaps Woody Washington was was taking were Trey Brown snaps. I'd have to go back and look, yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah, I, don't I, I need sure. to look to be sure of that. But every time I thought to check, it was Jaden opposite him. I think Woody was kind of going on both sides. Yeah, could be, absolutely could be. Um. And that's the weird thing to me, though, guys, because, I mean, we talk, you know, we're talking about all these young guys getting in. At safety, I mean, Turner Yell, Fields, Norwood played some safety. Is that it? Um, Broyles. Very yeah, briefly. Right. Broyles briefly was in there, yeah. Yep. He was in there on the last drive for a while, wasn't he? Uh, I'm not I, sure. It was one of those last, it was one of those fourth quarter drives. I know because I was like 20. Oh, God, that's broil. Like, it took me a second to, to process it, but I can't remember which one it was. It could have been the second to last. I will say this about Woody Washington's interception. I don't know the last time that I've seen, and you th- you would think that Trey Brown would be really good at this because of his speed and, his, and specifically his catch-up speed. I don't know the last time I've seen a corner who was beat, who made up ground and got underneath the receiver and caught the ball at the high point and took it away. He literally, I, I, I don't know how you would be able to go back and find this. I guess you could because there haven't been too many uh, interceptions in that secondary. But <laughs> like, when the last time I, they had a guy that, Colvin, that high pointed a football, yeah, it has to be years. Because the last Tony couple Jefferson. years they haven't been able to get up that high. Yep. Uh, you know, and they tried uh, to catch it instead of batting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like and yeah, they like were playing defense. Like that's my ball. Like he went up. Like you don't ever see OU defense. No OU defense back other than Parnell Motley has been like that's my football. It, it's kind of yep. like the Alex Grinch quote that uh, Kersey tweeted out today. Maybe we're doing too much looking at the scoreboard, uh, but there are stretches of time, not long stretches of time, but there's a time <laughs> where we're almost guilty of being pretty good defensively. Like screw around and do it much longer. They're actually going to call us good. <laughs> Like that's a great quote about where Oklahoma is defensively yeah. right now. That's it's a fact. And guys, you know, it was a little bit of a stand-up as, routine by Alex Grinch today. <laughs> as much as Probably I love the play, on the, back. the the pick by Washington, the pass breakup where he came in from behind. I think it was on Joshua Moore. Yeah, and it they was. had him on that post yes. route, and he just slapped the ball down from in front of him. When's the last time you saw an OU corner make a play like that? Sure. That doesn't. I mean, now you can kind of argue Trey Brown did it early in the game. 
except you know he jumped in front of it and picked it but that was that was so clean i mean like there was no no chance for interference he just went around him and reached in and that's what alex grinch is looking for those guys with that kind of length where they've got the arms where they can get in front of the passing lane even if they're not in perfect position they can still make a play on the ball yeah that's what six one gets you versus five ten. yeah I mean, you you talking about Justin Harrington, Kerry. I mean, think he couldn't get in the way of something like that? What's funny is seeing how big Harrington is, that might be how big Jordan Mukes is at this moment. Yeah. And that is crazy. You start to, to understand. About. Yeah. You ought to go see him one night, Kerry, just to like it it's hard to put in perspective how big he is as a DB until you've like looked at him because he's huge. I mean, he looks huge on tape, yeah. yeah. I mean there's yeah. no doubt. I look at him and I'm like, whoa. Yep. I mean, He's, even the first time he went back when visits were still happening, when he went to OU mm-hmm. and he was a sophomore, I was like, man, that kid's big. Because he's longer than Eaton. I mean, like, uh, he's right. I mean, he's just big. And, I mean, big in frame. Like like I said, everybody's like, well, you know, I talked to this coach that played against him, and he didn't make you – know, he, he's raw, man, but you talk about tools. I mean, that's the kind of guy that Grinch and those guys want to coach up. They want to find a way to make that work. Two guys that were kind of the focus of uh, the defensive session today. Uh, Joshua, where do you think David Awegbu is right now? Because there was some, there was a lot of promise from him on Saturday. And then uh, we'll get to Nick Benito here in a second. Uh, I thought Awegbu was unbelievable. Like, just it's one of those things where it's kind of the opposite of what we're talking about with Jaden Davis. Like, there are more peaks and valleys. But, man, when he flashes, he just does stuff that other guys just can't do. I mean, his his size, his length, his speed. Uh, the, you know, everybody talks about the the time from that Ellinger play and how that affected the game. But what other linebacker would have even been over there to make that play? You know, he's the only reason Ellinger had to reach out. Clo- I mean, he I, like I said, I thought he was really good. Obviously made the huge special teams play. And... He's still learning it, but I, there's going to come a point, I think, where Oklahoma's going to have to make a choice because Deshaun White is a is a steady leader type of player. David Aguebu feels like the kind of guy that can take that defense to a different level because of the things he can do athletically. Aguebu had a little bit of that Kenneth Murray. Well, I think that's, I think, that's what Riley said. Yeah, Riley compared him to Kenneth Murray and just in terms of his physicality. I sure. think he was talking, he's talking about they are different athletically. Which, which by the way... Kenneth Murray looked great he on did. Monday night. I mean, that was like that was fucking fun. Yep. The way that Watching he murdered him fly that receiver. Around. I mean, my God. I, I, there, there was a second I was like, "That a babe? Like you look great out there." Well, and and uh, Lewis kind of proud of him, drooling all over. Yeah, him. he was. He loves Kenneth Murray, and it sounds like like anything that you ever read about the Chargers, they love Kenneth Murray, obviously. Which he never got any play at all on Hard Knocks, which was weird. That. Like the first first rounder in history that didn't get a lot of attention on Hard Knocks. Although Eichert told me Too it's boring. because it's because he you don't want to be on camera, right? Well, he said you get fined. Like as the, a rookie, the kangaroo court will fine you. If, That's pretty funny <laughs> if you have a big moment on Hard Knocks. That's so, pretty funny. And I know he's been out there shopping the uh, Superformance cars, the uh, the uh, the F the the GT forties and the Cobras, the sixty five Cobra replicas, like. He's really into that. So he's obviously interested in spending money. He doesn't want to give it up. Agreed. Uh, yeah, yeah, respect. I, <laughs> yep. I I feel that. I'd love to have any of those cars. I mean, oh, I'm, I've wanted one of those cars for a decade. Yep. I mean, he doesn't yep. have it on launch. Like, I knew all about Ford versus <laughs> Ferrari before it ever came out. Like, I've been fascinated by Carroll Shelby for decades. Oh, they make a they make a Shelby truck that I am absolutely enamored with, but that will never ever happen. Because it's not it's not an F nine fifty. It's just a bad truck. It's true. Truck. It's just it's just an F one fifty. I mean, yeah. it's too a little too sissy for me. Uh, whatever, <laughs> with its seven hundred horsepower, whatever madness is in there. By the way, we want to take a moment to uh, thank our sponsor for the Unofficial 40 Podcast. That is Dead Soxy. Dead Soxy dot com. D e a d s o x y dot com. Uh, I'm on their website right now, and uh, they have a fantastic selection of socks. The uh, Crimson and Cream Color Waves, if you uh, want to partake in something like that for game days or just to wear to work. Uh, the boardroom collection, the uh, also the, uh, the, the socks that no one can see, the no-show socks, 
which Eddie is a big fan of because uh, it lets his New Balance shine. New Balance, as he walks down golf the street. shoes, whatever you need. Uh, but yeah, right now, uh, members of Soonerscoop.com and listeners to the podcast can uh, go to Dead Soxy, fill in your order, and use the promo code Boomer. Uh, just enter your keyword at checkout, Boomer, and you'll get thirty percent off uh, your thirty uh, percent off promo code exclusively for Sooner Scoop uh, listeners and subscribers. Uh, really high quality source fabrics. Uh, turn up your sock game to a new level. I've got a ton of socks. Uh, the ones that Dead Soxy sent over the packaging. It's just a big time luxury shopping experience without a ton of cost. I know they're not like going to Walmart and buying some stupid socks. These are big time, high quality socks at a reasonable price. And uh, Eddie, I know you've been a really big fan. I wore mine to the uh, Texas non-state fair over the weekend. Very comfortable. Yeah, I mean, they're the best sock that I've worn that you can walk around for a long time in. And they don't get that sweaty feel, which is kind of nice. And all you need to do is go over to deadsoxy.com, D-E-A-D-X-O-X-Y.com. S-O-X-Y. Did I get that right? You got that complete, the terrible read on well, your part. Well, I'm not much of a reader, but I am somebody <laughs> that can influence into somebody buying Dead Soxy socks. D E A D X. No. S. <laughs> Damn it. This is going to go in the live read Hall of Fame. Try it one more time. D E A D S O X Y dot com. Use that Dead promo socks. code BOOMER. 30% off their best dress socks that you've ever put on. And always, everybody remember, stay soxy. Okay, so you come off a of text. I know this was a question that was asked, Josh, of people in terms of, you know, how do recruits feel about this? And it's almost like I, I, I've been surprised. Not surprised, but I think people should be surprised by the fact that Oh, you start really hasn't deterred anybody. It's not like, you know, I don't know how Kamar Wheaton feels about it or anything like that. Maybe mm -hmm. that's one person, but it's not like there's a whole lot of prospects that are just living and dying by what happened at OU Texas, it seems to me. No, I mean, the, you know, the two guys that you can say maybe would have a real interest are two guys that are pretty new names, and I think we kind of know where they stand. You've got Billy Bowman. Um, you know, who, who released a top three yesterday that didn't have Texas in it. So it makes you wonder if maybe that was the death knell for them. They kind of just decided to walk away. And then on the other side, his teammate, Jatavion Sanders, who uh, we've got some notes up in, in uh, Oklahoma this morning. Um, it's It's been an interesting response from him so far from what I've gathered. Um, Bowman, on the other hand, um, was apparently in Norman recently. Uh, was supposed to maybe go up again this weekend and ended up, uh, Denton Ryan ended up picking up a Saturday game. Uh, he was going to come up because their game was, was off and ended up picking a Saturday, uh, game up against Denton High. So he won't be making the trip. But so far, I mean, guys, that's the world we're living in. Recruits are not, it's not OU Texas anymore. That's not like the way that goes where, you know, and we, t and Bob and I talked about this last week. This is not 2004 where Adrian Peterson goes to the Red River, you know, rivalry or shootout at that point and walks away and is like, oh, I think maybe I'm going to go to Oklahoma because they just clobbered Texas. Like, there's all these other options and all these other availabilities. And guys, these high school kids, they haven't seen, they've seen Texas win once since they were in junior high. Like, this isn't some groundbreaking event that OU wins in that game. They kind of know the score and that's not a flex. That's not anything. It's, it's like it usually is. The, losing that game hurts Oklahoma a lot more than winning it helps them. Well, and you also have to remember it's a different era. When Mac Brown was at Texas, mm -hmm. his main goal was cultivating Texas high school talent, even to the detriment of recruiting nationally. And, and Tom Herman has gone out and recruited nationally, whereas everything in that program was centered around the Texas high schools, Texas high school coaches, and Texas athletes, that that philosophy no longer exists at Texas. So that plays a part in it as well, I think. Oh, you're exactly right. I mean, they they I mean, guys, you remember when when Texas won the national championship and Mac Brown sitting on the stand, you know, with the crystal ball and he's like, We just want to thank all the Texas high school yeah, coaches. I mean the they, first they, things he said. Yeah, like they don't they did not mess around about it. And 
the problem was they went too far with it. It became, well, we're just going to get Texas kids in spite of, you know, maybe there's a better guy in Florida or wherever. And that's where, or they, they, they would lose trouble. out. Who was that running back in Colorado they lost out on? And the, it was like they had, a, they, Matt got a reason every once in a while where he got screwed over by a national recruit to just say, Oh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're just getting Texas yep. kids. Oh, that that was uh, Darrell Scott, the um, the kid. He went. He was from California, but he went to Colorado instead of Texas. And the I know famous our- story where Jason Sukamel was <laughs> <Yep>. it. He <laughs> went exactly. to his commitment party and they locked him out. Like it was an ESPN zone or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. They locked it. I don't exactly. think I've ever they heard would that. Would not story. let him oh, yeah, in the building. You should ask yes. Sukamel about that. That's a great story. <laughs> Uh, I bet that went real because well. Because he was with the Texas him. site. They locked him out because he yeah. wasn't going to choose Texas. And went basically, basically, Sukumel flies out there, and he's reporting on the board. He's like, guys, I don't see this going Texas's way. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and change my crystal ball real quick. Uh, guys, I or can't tell gas, you if the Texas me. hat's on oh, the way table to go. because I can't see Non-company the table. company man. Yeah. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, that was that was a fantastic story. But yeah, I mean, you know, and and Bob can add on to this because I mean, he obviously was talking about this last week. But it's just not the same animal as it used to be. This isn't every top guy goes to Oklahoma. But you know, you talk about Oklahoma making a move for Billy Bowman. Oklahoma's got a chance to land five of the top ten players in the state of Texas, it's and that's crazy. been a long time Insane. since something like that's happened. Yeah, there's there's two two points from last Saturday. One, obviously, social. The social distance of no recruits are even there so we know that you know they can never go in the locker room couldn't do face-to-face interactions but at least they experienced the atmosphere and got a feel of it and this was OU's year to host so you know you would have brought the best of the best that you you want to see so that doesn't happen and then it's 11 a.m kick it's on tv but how many recruits were watching florida and the aggies instead it's not like it was the only game in town where you know all eyes are glued to just watching OU Texas that just doesn't exist, and you know I'd be very curious to know how 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 many of those you know 2022 kids were locked in actually watching that game, or were they just channel surfing and just seeing you know what was the better game at that particular moment? Guys, I thought one of the more interesting just recruit reactions that I saw was Bryce Foster commenting on the clock situation with just like eyeball emojis like that he was dialed in and knew what was going on there like i was like that's kind of positive for oklahoma i would say absolutely you uh, i mean that's a excellent point by both of you like you just at this point you just want their attention just prove to us you're watching this and know what's going on um because you know you've got to think a and M beating Florida—that's a big deal for that's that's a big thing for them in the Bryce Foster recruitment because that's their big hurdle is they have to prove to him they're not just some second-rate SEC program, and a big win like that obviously gives you a lot of credibility. All right, outside of that, um, I mean it's a bizarre weekend in the Big Twelve. What the Big Noon kickoff has now become like Kansas. You're not fired up for the Kansas West Virginia game Kansas, Saturday. West Virginia is the Ooh. I'll be waking up at 10:59:50 to get in that one. Thanks to Baylor <laughs> and uh, their 44 uh, contact tracing slash COVID issues. While we've Wait, been well, how, like, what? Kind how of... how did that affect it? Because Baylor and OSU was a night game anyway. So how did Big Noon kickoff become this Kansas game? Because that think, didn't affect it. I think they had to fill it somehow, Bob. I'm not sure what who was supposed to play at that time, but it. Yeah, I mean, because it was supposed to be a, ABC was OSU Baylor. Yeah, I have no idea. They were going head to head versus Georgia Bama, which would have been a disaster. <laughs> Ratings bonanza is what you're saying. I I have no idea. I just know that they met, they had to move that game to to 11 a.m. to. I don't know what they were filling though. I have no idea. I don't yeah, care. I, don't I didn't plan on watching it. I didn't. still don't plan on watching it. <laughs> still don't. Plan. Well, it's not there to watch. So. Well, it'll be at big noon. Oh, you mean which the Kansas, is 11 West Virginia game? Yeah. yeah, it's weird that people in Waco didn't believe there's a problem. That's unusual for them, especially when Art Bryles isn't calling Waco home anymore. I know. I mean, you know, they're they're so quick to react to a potential crisis. I just wonder, like, how little precautions they're taking Seriously. for it to spread that much. I mean, I know it can spread quickly, 
But my God, were they doing that past the apple game in the aisles on the plane on the way back? Like mouth to mouth deal? <laughs> they kept uh, what's his name around to, to do the pass the apples around. Uh, what was that? What was the coach's name that was down there after Bryles filled in? Oh, God. The guy. Grobe. Uh, Grobe. Grobe? Oh, Jim, Jim Grobe. Grobe. Yeah, I forgot about him. Jim Grobe. Who's Sean Oakman? I've never seen him around here. <laughs> he's the biggest guy, guy that's in your locker guy room. guy raping the woman over in the corner. I think he got oh, off he on got that. acquitted. He yeah. got acquitted, well, so we can't let, make fun I mean, of him anymore. <laughs> well, and let's be fair. I mean, like, like he's he a senior in event in that category. Sure. Yeah, he Not was down the, there. He was the one who got acquitted. Yeah, he was the one guy that was raping people off in the corner. That's true. Um, it takes me back to that stupid... Um, skit that they did from Friday Night Lights. Who? Uh, what's her name? Uh, Amy... Uh, oh, Saturday Night Live? N- Amy Poehler? Amy, no, Amy Poehler uh, from Trainwreck. Oh, Schumer. Amy Schumer. Schumer. Yeah, they did that one where she was walking around with giant wine glasses as Coach oh, Taylor's that wife. that was great. <laughs> and it was like, you mean we can't rape anymore? <laughs> so... Hmm. It was a good skit. Go watch it. Effect, it I wasn't laughing. It was funny. I guess in our times we're in, we can't make fun of that stuff anymore. Not anymore. Uh, anyway, Thanks, Baylor. Anyway, Oklahoma bye week. Uh, you know, no one's given the indication that the players are just free to go off and do whatever they want this weekend. You get the sense that I think they'll keep them around here. Yeah, players kind of get the yeah. time off, but they they kind of are expected to be around. Well, here. Nick Benito talked about it a little yeah. bit today, just like, hey, I know that we can't go out. We, I mean, there's just it, it it's the reality of the situation. There's a sacrifice that has to be made if you want to play the rest of the season. And I mean, that's the one good thing that comes out of the Texas win is Everybody like kind of this stays weekend could have been a disaster for COVID. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. we we talked about it on the post game podcast, just as far as like. I think big picture, when you walk out of the Cotton Bowl with that win, like what it could have been if you're on the other side of that and you lose that game in the manner that they would have lost it with just a complete meltdown choke. I mean, I can't even imagine what the last four days would have been like here on the board, Twitter, radio, wherever, if OU's one and three going into a bye week. And there really is some kind of what the hell is happening in Norman moments. Like, I, I, I think it's it, it we and we kind of talked about it a little bit at the beginning of the podcast, just as far as is it that jumping off point or that moment of rallying for the Spencer Rattlers of the world for the defense to go out and say, you know, for the better part of the two overtimes, two of the four overtimes they came up with stops. By the way, what's the COVID uh, situation in Austin right now? Are we expecting an outbreak? And uh, I think it's over in Texas? twenty days down there. Oh, God. Well, you know those players <laughs> made it sound like they all got it June, July, because they were ready. Well, that means they're ready the, to get it again for the conference season. Where Just they like went. Eddie is, Eddie's times run out. The antibodies are probably gone. I don't even why I'm sitting I, in the same room with him. Right oh, now. I said the other day, I'm I'm ready. I'm prepared for another battle. Hope it brings it this time. Put this over your mouth, will you, while you're here? <laughs> Not going to chloroform me again. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, look, the defense was, as we said at the start of the podcast, they were awful for a five minute stretch. Uh, they weren't great in overtime, but they came up with the stop. All that really mattered was that Spencer Rattler became a different guy. Austin Stogner made a play for him. Uh, Drake, Sto- I mean that that throw to Drake Stoops. That was just the fact that he kept his wits about him while he was running up the field and saw that and hit a perfect pass. Like to me, that's his. I mean, clearly it's his best play of the day. Man, I thought that the the eight minute drive, the two throws to uh, Theo Weiss were those just were good. as good and. You know, the the play that I, I, I don't think a lot of people realize, just the difficulty of the throw, the two-point conversion was difficult. Yes. Yeah. That's the best yeah. thing. That was a hell of a throw, and that's that probably was, the yeah. shortest distance. Yeah. and that Because that was great coverage by the corner. He's right a perfect where he should throw. be. Yeah. Yep, yep. And big on Weez for getting that, getting to that ball and catching sure. it. Sure, absolutely. absolutely. But, I mean, guys, we saw Theo Weez go up against Derek Stingley at the five-star. Well, you guys were there. I was watching it on video. 
Um, but I mean, he. The thing I like about his You've just game. Been waiting for that moment of like, yeah, like here he is. This like, is it. For him to have that game, I feel like he's that kind of guy that rises to the occasion. And if he knows that he's going to go out and be able to dominate a football game, he's just going to play that much harder and that much better. Like getting him involved, I think could be a godsend for this offense. Well, and do you look back and give Tanner Mordecai some credit for that? Because Mordecai is yeah. the guy that yeah. got him going. Yep. That's a good point, Josh. Because I was, was going to ask you, Josh, did you know, <clears throat> Theo just not get himself open those first couple games? Is he just still figuring it out, how, how to work in space? I, <clears throat> God, sorry. I don't think that's no, what it was. I mean, <laughs> I, I really don't because, I mean, and you saw it especially a lot in the first half. Spencer Rattler still has plenty of work to do. He is making reads before the snap and making decisions. And it's the, the pick that he threw to Overshown, if he just if he waits a split second to let Stogner clear Overshown, that's a huge play down the middle of the field. He just he was in too big a hurry, didn't read the linebacker. He'd made up his mind he was going to Stogner, and then throws that easy pick. And like I said, if he's just processing what he's seeing instead of coming up with a decision on the fly or coming up with it beforehand, it's a huge play for Oklahoma, and they're they're in great business, probably at midfield. And instead, you know, it's a huge play for Texas and kind of got them going. So it's stuff like that where I think he's just saying before the snap, I want Austin here. I want he, and, and that's okay. Like, it's okay to have the guy you like the route he's running. You like, I mean, like, that's fine. I, that's all good. That's understandable. And it's good to have confidence in your guys. But you also have to understand – not every play your arm is good enough to make it sometimes you've got to move on and go to the next guy even as uh, specifically and especially talented as spencer rattler is guys one thing that i would like to see more of and i think at times you see it but at other times like on a first down uh run where he was one-on-one I'd like to see a little bit more George Kittle or Gronkowski out of Austin Stogner in the open field. I feel like... Like running people over so, and I mean, stuff. He had, that, he had that fair. one play where he did bowl through about two or three people, but the one play where he barely made the first down, he just let a, a, a defensive back take out his knees uh, and he went right down. Like I just I think there's more kind of manimal in him than he's showing. Might be something you know, that... You just kind of develop over time. You get more comfortable sure. on the field. I don't know, Josh. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eddie. Points over. I think he's Points done. over. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. No, Point made. I, you know, I, I, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, with, with guys like Gronk and those kind of guys, I mean, Gronk's from Pittsburgh, man. There's there's just a certain level of nastiness to those guys. George Kittle's from it. Norman. Come on. Hey, hey. East don't Norman. mess around the mean streets of Norman, okay? That just, you know. <laughs> Bruce uh, Kittle was not living in East Norman. <laughs> Unless made, he was living in the vineyard. They made him. Li- they made I mean, him. He's living over in the vineyard, which is right next across the street from me. They made him uh, live by him. Live by himself. They just put out cat food every night for him to eat. He was living in Brookhaven. There's. I almost have zero doubts about that. And well, on Friday nights, he got a steak if he broke seven tackles or something. Yeah, and didn't happen very often. He did go to Norman North. Yeah, he was living in Brookhaven. No, he was at Norman High. Oh, he, he was Norman no, High. He was at Norman High. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Norman. I did cover several of his games, so I should know that. <laughs> I was I was uh, thinking of Charlie Kolar, sorry. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think Austin just so deceptive to me. Like, I still don't feel like I ever get a good grasp on just how – where he really is, is. Yeah. yeah like i he he just surprises me sometimes he'll do something I'm like man i didn't see that as possible i mean the the catch he made near the goal line where the guy cut his legs out from underneath him and he landed smack on his back like that would have been completely understandable a lot of guys wouldn't have hung on to that ball um i feel like we're doing the billy joe preston friday night lights uh show where we're just bitching about high school kids he needs to be more aggressive when he catches the he's ball. Gotta I just, tough. He's got to get tough. He's just too soft. He just needs to be tough. If I had that body at his age. Why is that such a thing in all the Friday Night Lights, whether it's the movie or the TV show? It's creepy They old always guys. have to have the call-in radio shows that have a <laughs> prominent role in the, in the <laughs> broadcast. I don't understand that. I think, I think they're taking the... Um, the cues from the old uh, 
God, what's a stupid Tom Cruise movie I can't think of now? All the right moves. Oh, Carrie. Where you just, uh, yeah, I know that was almost a yeah, that's, major That's 10 league. extra minutes on the elliptical today, sir. You're going to, that's that's not going to get it done. <sighs> okay, I'll do it later tonight. I already went <laughs> once today. Um, no, it's like throwing trash in the coach's yard after he loses. That's that's do essentially what that? the call radio stuff is. No, now they put for sale signs in your yard. And they call them bomb threats and cool stuff. Now they just tweet at them. Or they stand up in the middle of a press conference and say bleeper right in the bleep. I think that was more of a high school thing. That's though, over. Wasn't it? Yeah. Thank God that's over. Jameis. Happened to Trey Young. I know we were there. Never forget. That that cop bounced that kid's head off the door when he took him out. <laughs> Love it. Normal cops. <laughs> All right. Um Outside, okay, so Josh, Lucky he didn't get shot. Bob, I know you guys have been planning a lot of high school games that just have not Ugh. worked out. Uh, Stop it. COVID has, I mean, Jinx is out this weekend, uh, but all across, uh, you've tried to see Car- Kamar Wheaton, uh, and COVID canceled some of those plans. Josh, I know you've been battling some of the same stuff, but uh, how bad is it in high schools right now? It seems, and and Bob can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like it's worse in Oklahoma as far as cancellations. Like Texas, I feel like there's so many schools like, okay, they lost a game, we lost a game, let's go play instead. Like I feel like it's easier for these connections to get made in Texas where they're just kind of like, you know, oh, you know, the two teams that are healthy, they'll go play. Okay, fine. So you're getting a lot of makeups in that way. Like where you'll hear a game's canceled on Monday and then by Tuesday afternoon there's been a reschedule for that team. So – there's a lot of that kind of going on, and I'm but I sure feel like that was in Oklahoma, in, in, it's been more pure cancel. I'm sure that was in Florida, well, too, because you would see Mario Williams, and you saw him yeah. play in a game that wasn't originally scheduled. Yes, the the game that was on one day, changed to another day, changed back to the original day, and then changed opponent. That was It well, changed four times from when I scheduled it. The, the thing we're seeing now in the state is we're at district part. You can't just do that. You know, we got Booker T versus McGinnis in 48 hours bixby carl albert within 48 hours but it's all district play now so you're kind of stuck trying to figure out how how in the world you're going to make that all work and i was tempted to maybe see ethan downs this this week i have not seen him this uh this year but now elk city has covid so that game is off the table and so i'm looking to see uh jacob sexton against the bombers that is still on as of now but that's sort of really the story for me is like what you know on monday might not be the case on wednesday or thursday so you just have to keep on checking and that that gets annoying that that's why i made my schedule earlier this year and literally if the game was borderline interesting i put it on my list usually i've got about five or six games per week this week i've got like or this year i've got like 20 per week because i just know i'm gonna have some crap outs on my initial choices so i've got to know where I can go, what my backup plan is going to be. So it's been, I mean, so far, I've been pretty lucky. Really, the only guy that I wanted to see, and I've had two separate shots at him and missed him both times, is Cody Jackson. But I've seen Cody several times, so if there's one guy that I can probably, you know, kind of bite that bullet on, he's the guy. Well, I mean, I know we're still waiting to find out, like, credentials and stuff for TCU and what's going to go on there. But, you know, possibly we could see Kamar Wheaton uh, a, a week from now. Or Bowman. Yep. Or Bowman Billy Bowman. Or yeah. Wheaton. Those are the ones I've got circled. So possibly that's coming up on the radar. But kind of like with everything else, it's like, why wasn't Bob on the pod, the post game this week? Well, it's just COVID. I mean, everything is crazy. We're making schedules, you know, by the minute. Everything's changing. And, We're just trying to, kind of like today, we're doing the pod at an odd time, but we still want to get it up on Wednesday. It'll still be up uh, before the evening. So uh, just kind of hang with us on on a lot of this stuff. And that includes whether or not we're going to be at a game to cover a game, a college game, a high school game. It's just a little bit crazy. By the way, I do want to say thanks to everybody that took advantage of our, uh, our annual promotion that we ran after the Texas game. Uh, Josh spearheaded that thing. I was kind of poo-poo on it because uh, I didn't know how Kinda. we'd go. I, I just didn't want to do it. Um, but 
it was amazing the response we got the largest promotion that we've ever run on the website i mean it was a it was incredible so thanks to everybody who signed up and uh if you missed it sorry yeah i i I just literally had somebody hit me up on twitter like could i still do that man they they give us a time they give us a certain amount of time we can do it and then it's over and we don't get to do it anymore so it's not it's not like we don't want to give it to you we'd be happy to but we we are not the only people that get to make this decision so um but yeah no the response was just massive and honestly terry i mean i didn't feel like we pushed it that hard like no we didn't like we didn't when we do the gear promo we were all traveling and i uh mean uh-huh yep uh it was it was surprising and you know um I think the pinky that I gave to have it one more extra day, I, I think it'll grow back. I think it's going to be okay. So, you know, it's a little harder to type working on my inner, you know, my inner key now, but um, it's going to, it's going to get better. Uh, Bob, you did get to talk to Lon Kruger yesterday and uh, Brady Manick, and I'm not, did you talk to Austin Reeves as well? Austin Reeves too, yeah. How did yep, that go? So, and uh, give us an update, kind of on hoops and where they're at right now with everything that's going on. The guarantee to time practice. You know, practice officially starts today, so they can finally get things going. But yeah, it just feels weird because you don't even have a schedule out. You know, you usually you 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 know how things are shaking out, but they're still adjusting things because of COVID. Talking about playing more conference games before Christmas than what they've ever done, and. It, it helps a little bit because you have a lot of leadership with Brady, Austin, Kirk, Weth, Lonis Williams, and then you're still waiting on Mo Gibson and Elijah Harkless, and that changes the ceiling of this this team considerably because they need a lot more help in the uh, backcourt. But, I, I mean, you, you talk to them. It didn't sound like they were as mentally down as maybe I would have thought that they would have been missing out on the Big 12 tournament, NCAA tournament. I know we're months removed from all of that we're you know six seven months past that point but that's still that's when covid kicked in was when you get into the heart of basketball season. it just erased a basketball season it did it just took it away and it sounded like those guys were a little more upbeat and ready to attack this year as opposed to lamenting about what could have been last year bobby you said uh possibly maybe as late as the first week of november on a schedule maybe yeah, I mean, because it's just still a lot That's of things. That's so crazy to me. The, the the one big part is all those, you know, the Maui, you know, the, you know, all those type of tournaments have just been either canceled or restructured. With, sure. Where's that? Is the Bahamas in South Dakota? Is, isn't that what they yes. came up with? That's, they were so, like, like, so. I saw them build. They basically build tournaments in front of your eyes on Twitter now. Exactly, yeah. and th- and that's why you can't release any schedules because everyone's still trying to figure out how to get into a multi-team type of event in November or first part of December and still have it work within your conference schedule and things of that nature. So it's 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 been a real mess, but it. it you know, sooner seen they got a pretty good competitive schedule, just like they always have, where that out of that out of conference schedule is going to help come tournament time. And I do believe there will be a tournament when we'll, we're talking come uh, this next March. Okay, they they outright canceled the battle for Atlantis. There were reports that it was going to be re- relocated to Sioux Fall, but I didn't even know that until I Googled it. The games that we do know on what Oklahoma's... Uh, re, re, <laughs> oh, yeah, they should have let him go up there. That would have been great. They have a nice... They, I, I, oh, you played up there just last week, didn't to, they? Just, just bring back the Anchorage thing. Oh, right? you know what they should do? They should bring the back the All-City. They should bring back the All-City Classic. What oh are you no, Tulsa Oklahoma and Oklahoma State? <laughs> You're died, a terrorist. It died a well-deserved death. The All City, it, when it became a classic and it was no longer a tournament, it was okay. Just bring stupid. back the All City tournament. I, I'm, all all, co- I'm all college down for tournament. the All College tournament. You're I guess an we gotta, influencer, Eddie. Get it done. All right, we'll do that today. We'll start it today. The games that we do know about Oklahoma's non-conference and Matt Lor- Norlander had put it out there a couple weeks ago. Florida, Arkansas, in Tulsa at Central Florida. Xavier is their Big East crossover game, and then Washington is their Pac-12, Big 12 crossover game. That game's in Vegas, so I'll look forward to going out there for that one. Get a cheap flight. I'll drive. You're not driving. I will. But really, you talk basketball, it's still all about 
Damian Collins. And we're a month away, literally a month away from signing day, November 11th through the 18th as the early signing period. And all indications are he will sign during the early period. I think that's got to help. He can't visit uh, Lexington, or at least if he does visit Kentucky, it won't be in the format that you all know that recruits would love to do with the coaches and the facilities. And so if you think OU and Kentucky are one and two, as we, we all do, the fact that he's willing to make that choice in the next month that's got to feel good if, if you're a fan of the Sooners. And so how did Kentucky get around the rule on that deal? They're Kentucky. They they're, they're, that's prob- Eddie's answer is probably more correct, but what they're really trying to say is they had established contact with Collins before Lucas arrived. And that's why whenever Collins that's talks about Kentucky— That's kind of why you hire people. It's like saying, it's like saying, oh, well, his brother knew him forever. They were brothers, so— Come on down, Kate. Because the only, man. again, the, the, the thing is that Lucas isn't an assistant, and that's why you have to say it was a prior existing relationship with the school before Lucas so got there. So they're saying, not Kentucky is saying we were recruiting role. him before Lucas got here. Is yes. What Kentucky so is they're saying say. Coach Justice. That's the name that Collins keeps throwing out there whenever they ask about Kentucky. Yeah, I've known Coach Justice. And, I mean, there, there's just no way to prove that that's not the case. Even if it feels deep down, that's probably not the case. He didn't get the offer until answer. Lucas showed up. So how how much of a relationship? Eh. I feel like um, if we keep talking about this, Eddie's going to get triggered because basketball waivers and rules really get him triggered. Chris Murray already got his, so we're good. Okay. Even though it doesn't make any sense that it took until the fifth game of the season for him to get it, but... It doesn't. <laughs> I guess the paperwork got cleared. By the way, um, on Chris Murray... Will he start? Um, I don't Wait. think so. Not after the way the offensive line played at Texas. I do think... and you know, It was just so awkward. <laughs> We're talking to Tyrese Robinson on Monday or Tuesday with interviews. and He it's was like, really good, by the way. So, I mean, is Chris Murray going to take your job? Or how's this work? Well, see, this is what... <laughs> like, I talked to Gabe Eichert about this. And, and the only thing he told me was, well, he would have been starting if he had been here and eligible when practices started. And I heard him talk about it last night uh, and expand on it on the kind of... They didn't have the Lincoln Riley show, so they had uh, Gabe and Plank join Teddy and, and Toby. And he explained it this way, that if things had started with Murray eligible, they would have played him at right guard. They would have put Tyrese Robinson at right tackle. They would have moved Adrian Ely, Ely to left tackle. And then you have Marquise Hayes and Creed Humphrey. So that would have been the starting. It would have been shifted. But now I think he'll probably... No, no, this does not come from Gabe. Now I think what's most likely is he just comes in and spells the guard position a little bit. But and that says I Anton's think, done his job then. Yeah. And I I I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the season you see him giving Creed Humphrey a blow every once in a while because I think they feel like he could be their center next season. What about Rain? Just keep him He's at guard. He's been playing guard. Yeah. I mean, he, like Ian McIver has been the I mean, two-year you know backup. It, yeah, you know how it goes. I mean, you, yeah. it, you, you get them both experience, you get them both in practice, and you see what happens. They should play two centers, two balls. Think that would improve OU's chances of scoring? It would improve yeah. their chances at penalties. Hmm. Yes. Can you imagine synchronized snapping, and if it wasn't, it's a penalty every time? Yeah. There's no way the big North. There's no way the Big Twelve refs could handle that. <laughs> That'd send Mike DeFee's head into a absolute tizzy. I'm so glad he wasn't there to to browbeat everybody before the game well, started. You, you know that they wouldn't have added the time on the clock, though. That's not by the rules. Play by the rules when you play on Mike DeFee's field. That is interesting, though. Yeah, there wasn't enough anger to get flags on everybody on the field before that game started. Can you imagine living in a world, though, where, say, Texas does go for two? They get it. Oh, you lose the game, and then it comes out on Monday afternoon that... The, uh, the time <laughs> the, thing. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, guys. Never should have been an overtime in the first Won't place. Won't let it happen again. Oh, my god! I'm glad we're not in that world. I probably would have drove to uh, the Big 12 offices. We would have had to do, like, a bar stool, get arrested. 
at the Big 12 offices, yeah. that might be the best thing for us. <laughs> might still do great it. for Barstool. Might still do it. All right, guys, anything else you want to hit on before we get out of here today? Luther uh, Burden. Yeah, need to talk Luther Burden. Okay, let's do it. Five-star wide receiver 2022. Commits to Oklahoma. All yeah. Right, we're done. Yeah, <laughs> done. Stories. Oh, you um, just had to say his name. All right, we're good. That one's in the can. Uh, no, uh, you know, for those, I, I don't know, I, I guess maybe too focused on OU Texas thing in the last week. Oklahoma picks up five-star wide receiver Luther Burden, uh, number nine player in the country in 2022 uh, by Rivals Rankings, and is a guy that, you know, I I knew I liked him when I had first seen his tape, and I had really written him off. He was a guy that everyone had pegged Ohio State for months. I mean, because they just, ever since really Ezekiel Elliott, Ohio State pretty much goes into St. Louis and gets who they want, it, uh, who they want. and that's kind of what everybody thought was going to happen here. And Dennis Simmons, again, just kind of wows you with the stuff he does in the recruiting trail. Goes out, lands him. Um, and really, uh, guys, I, I did a video breakdown, and I didn't go in thinking I was going to make this comparison, but the more I watched him, there's a lot of C.D. Lamb in his game. I mean, a lot. Mm. Y- y- you watch that same ability to high point, that body control. Six to midnight. Yeah, for a guy that's six foot one, he's got a lot of moves in space. He's very fluid, kind of under control. Um, there, there's stuff, you know, you watch him and you'll, you'll see it. Now, I mean, I, I can't lie that they both are the number three, uh, in high school. So I, I worried a little bit. I was like, maybe that's me doing that in my head. But there, there are some skills that are very, very comparable between the two of them. And, uh, I know some others have compared him to Laquan Treadwell, the uh, you know former Ole Miss All American, went on to be a first round pick. So this is a guy that rivals that myself, that obviously every coach in the country is very high on. This is a huge gift for Oklahoma, and I think the biggest thing is in a class where it doesn't look like Oklahoma has that clear cut quarterback target kind of established right now. This could help them whenever they make their decision over who they're going to pursue, whether it's Ty Simpson, the the kid they've offered from Tennessee or anybody else, this just opens the door to say, hey, man, we've already got receivers going to be handled. You know, you got Mario Williams in front of you. We're still recruiting Emeka Ibuka. We've got Luther Burden and Jordan Hudson already committed. You know, there is, there's a lot to sell a quarterback on right now, and, and he's a huge piece of that. And I'm sure I, I sympathize with the crowd that's like, yeah, it's 2022. No visits have been taken. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Oh sure, sure. I you know I think anybody thinking this story will not reemerge at some point. Something will happen. Some school is going to catch his eye. He's going to take a trip at some point. Just don't be surprised by those things. But like I tell everybody and guess what? every hey, Luther, year, please don't pull a Jace McClellan. If you're going to change your mind, change your mind. Yeah. Don't wait. Yeah. Till well, I mean, at least wait until Carrie and Eddie drive up and see you, Luther. Yeah. Um, till we get some. <laughs> At least wait until we can make some money off of you, kid. Exactly. We got stories to pimp, sir. Would it be a surprise um, coming from a trash town like St. Louis? Oh, no. <laughs> That's a Cubs thing, Luther, if you're listening. Yeah, oh, no. I like Luther, the player. Or Ronnie Perkins. Yeah. Or Deron Neal. I mean, yeah. Mm. Deron Neal will cut you. Yes. Deron, and it's because you're also talking trash in his Cardinals, and he'll have none of that. Um, but yeah, no, he, he is, like I said, he's a big time guy, speed. I mean, I, I like him because he can do a little bit of everything. He's, um, another comp you could kind of make is maybe like a little bit of a bigger Sterling Shepard, kind of that ability. He could play outside. He could play the slot. There's a lot of ways you can use him. And, um, you know, again, he's, he's the number one wide receiver in the country, according to rivals rankings. And should Oklahoma get a Mecca Ibuka, that they could do that two years in a row, which is just kind of unbelievable. Josh, I really don't think that you make enough comparisons to shitty players. Like I would, I think you should start. Like he's it's a five star receiver. He reminds me of Manny Johnson. Uh, y- you know the guy that I think you could that I I can back myself up with is Derek Green, the uh, the defensive lineman they signed a couple years ago. Yes, uh-huh. I want to say I made a comparison to him of like Damon Williams, the the kid from Dallas that like, I don't think ever played a meaningful snap at Oklahoma, and everybody's like, oh yeah, that that guy, he was pretty highly ranked. I was like, yeah, he wasn't very good though. So you know, and, th- and that and Derek Green lasted like a week in Oklahoma. So. Or maybe um, not a shitty comparison, but just a, a comparison that pisses people off. Like, oh, yeah, he's a Joaquin Iglesias type. Oh, Everybody's yeah. going to be like, what? Joaquin Why do we want Iglesias. that? 
Yeah. Well, and people are crazy enough to think that's like insulting. Like, oh, no, he, that, that dude's trash. Yeah, he was a second round pick. He's real garbage. Uh, but yeah, no, sometimes I do. I struggle with that. And then the, my biggest problem is I always see like a guy that played for Florida in 2003. And I'm like, yeah, this guy. And they're like, who the hell is that? Nobody knows who I'm talking about. I'm like, okay, I'm just old. I'm making old comparisons. I need to remember, you know, some kid from two years That's ago. That's okay. I saw uh, Matt Leinert pimping his kid to Bruce Feldman. Was that his son? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that made it, that makes a little bit more sense. I didn't realize that's what was going on. That'll make you feel really fast. He's an oh. eighth grader, I think. Yeah, Leinert. Yeah. Is, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> is it Blake? Oh, no. I was going to ask, is that is that the product of uh, the Eskimo brothership of I believe that. Matt Leinert and I think he was it first. first has to be, right? I, yeah. I believe Matt Leinert was first to the trophy case. It's pretty cool. Brotherly love. Maybe he'll end up at OU and he'll come full circle. Maybe Tommy will kick your ass. Tommy? Griffin? Yeah. Nah, I got Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> I was n- I was never more intimidated by anybody in the world than Tommy Griffin. He's an intimidating we would, looking uh, man. When we play he like Taylor in Little League, because sure. he always helped out with the yeah. coaches or whatever. Uh-huh. Like, oh my god, this guy's gonna break me. And I then it was usually that. one of his sons that broke me. So yeah, I can see that too. All right, guys, uh, I have enjoyed it. Um, it's a bye week, so I hope you guys enjoy a little time off over the weekend, just kicking back watching. Some football. The games that will be played. The games that will be played. The games that we think will be played yeah. as of Wednesday afternoon. Exactly. Big Ten hasn't joined in yet. So we don't even get NFL here. tomorrow Sorry. night. I guess we get a Wednesday night special, Coastal Carolina and uh, Louisiana. That'll be a good game. Good for uh, BCS points for Iowa State. Yeah. And Kansas. Hey, Oklahoma has uh, two losses, top 25 programs, right? They're still they're oh you I mean oh you's entering the the perfect part of the uh, the of the year because they have an off week that means they'll get some AP votes next. The week. crazy thing just to just to drive everyone nuts and talk about Oklahoma State for a second uh, and maybe uh, remind them that Josh thinks they're two offensive linemen away from being a championship contender. Um, <clears throat> Don't sound so stupid now, do I? <laughs> <laughs> but but here's the thing: like Oklahoma State is sitting there, and yes, they look great, but. They haven't played Kansas State. They haven't played Iowa State. They haven't played Texas. They haven't played Oklahoma yet. OSU? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's a very much wait and see. You talk to Oklahoma State fans around here, they want Shane Illingworth to play in front of Spencer Sanders. Like, come on. Well, if your offensive line, I'll say this, if your offensive line is is playing well, I, I don't think that's a terrible thought. As long as, I mean, we, Tylen Wallace is back, man. I mean, if you're throwing the deep ball and you're getting Chuba Hubbard to... to crank out rushing yards Illingworth can be a pretty effective quarterback I don't think Spencer Sanders is as good a thrower as Illingworth is he's not but and you don't know if Spencer Sanders is still a turnover machine or not I thought the craziest thing out there this week was the uh, I think it was U.S. bets or whoever that basically had Oklahoma as the uh, the odds on favorite still to win the Big 12 championship which is just insane I know it's just Vegas uh, numbers OU. wise. Yeah, I go back and forth. I don't know. Like, oh, I, I, they, I don't know. They're if it's, still the most talented team in the conference. Sure, can are. Oklahoma run the table? Can they? Can, can they, they get three losses can they, from Iowa State and Kansas? I think that's the yep, other way right. to look at it. And they need a lot of help. And really, Kansas yep. State, who loses Skylar Thompson, so you might have a a little bit of a possibility there. But although mm-hmm. their quarterback was new Kansas member of the week, yeah, and I thought he played pretty TCU. good at TCU. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, uh, what's his name? Jordan, uh, I keep wanting to say Walker. I know it's not Walker, though. Winningham or something? Jordan Winningham. He transferred from Texas during the week. He's starting at quarterback now for <laughs> Kansas State. Whittington. <laughs> Whittington. He tried to go for the kill there, yeah. But, mm. Damn it. <laughs> uh, I mean, they all have Kansas, though, on their schedule, too. So, really, they only have to win. They have to win four games to clinch a spot, Kansas State or Iowa State. And we'll give them the Kansas game. So, they really only have to win three now. Yeah. Hey, why hasn't Greg Abbott sent our barbecue to the Stitter yet? He needs to pay up the bet. The Stitter bitching on Twitter? I'm bitching. No, to Eddie the is. Stitter bug. <laughs> he needs to send the barbecue up. He's too busy moving stuff around to Stillwater right now. Probably. To get barbecue. All right. Uh, that will do it. I think I had one other thought, but it probably wasn't a good one. So 
that will end it. Appreciate everybody listening. Thanks to Josh McQuistian, Eddie Radosevich, Bob Prisbillo for uh, leaving the sweatshop to join us. Uh, we'll now let him get back to work uh, cranking out iPhones. So thank you for listening, and uh, we'll check back in next week. No post-game pod this weekend because there is no game, but next week we'll be back. Maybe with- we will. Maybe we'll do a post-game pod for the Tulsa game. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of the Unofficial 40 Podcast right here from Soonerscoop.com.